I'm James Cherry. Um, yeah, I mainly build aviation models, big ones. Um, really, I get inspired by doing Technic builds. Uh, so these models will function as well. They have uh, power functions in them. Um, so various elements of them move around with, uh, with power functions, uh, radio control. Uh, so they're quite big, as I said. They weigh a lot. A little bit, um, uh, yeah, uh, delicate to move around. <laughs> but they take about an hour to assemble when I get them to the shows. Mm -hmm. All standard pieces bar the, the glazing of the canopies, which is I use uh, custom uh, glazing, which I vacuum form myself. Uh, make a mold and then vacuum form them. Uh, just Lego bricks for the canopies just don't work for me. So, um, yeah, I do that. And then obviously all the sticker work is custom. Uh, so vinyl cut stickers and dry rub transfers for these very small uh, ones. They, they sort of rub off of a sheet onto the Lego. Uh, but that kind of completes the detail for me. I'm really into detail models and... Um, this, this is uh, kind of the output of it, really. Right, it really shows. The, the amount of detail is just incredible, especially with the, the build is this big. It's, it's so cool. So what is this based off of? And what was kind of your inspiration as you worked on this? So mainly I just build the planes that were my favorite. So I've always loved aviation. Um, so these two are two of my favorite planes. I'm just starting another one. I have built a couple more planes in the past. Uh, uh, but the inspiration for this particular one was um, thinking about doing this deck diorama. Uh, which took a whole, whole load of time as well at the end of building the model. I really wanted to display it on the kind of uh, piece of the aircraft carrier deck. So, um, yeah, it can be displayed with in, in launch mode uh, as well. And it also has a, a radio control um, sound module in it. So it sounds like the real F-14. <laughs> so you can switch it on. Uh, I'll do it later for you guys if you want, when it's a bit quieter. Um, yeah, and it sounds the engine startups, everything, and it has uh, afterburner LEDs in it as well uh, for, for when it launches. Uh, so this one, this one has uh, been uh, nine months to build. Quite complicated for me. Very frustrating at times, but it's kind of worth it now. Yeah, so it takes a lot of time and dedication for this. So it's the, the F-14 is kind of the real life plane. You, did you use photos of that and stuff as you worked on it? Yeah, I study each of the planes I build, I study for probably a couple of months in advance of starting. And I blow up scale drawings, scale plans. And then I start, you know, measuring everything. So I make sure I always stay exactly to scale. Mostly it's, you know, within a couple of millimeters of the, the, the blueprints. So that's how, kind of the, the process I used to start with. And then I build a Technic frame inside and the functions and then kind of skin it, if you like. And the skinning is the bit that takes the time, to, especially this plane, very, a lot of angles all over it. Uh, very difficult, lots of mix all ball joints and hinges to get the various shapings done, yeah. So when, when you start on a build of this size, what, what's kind of the first part that you build of the plane when you're working on these types of builds? The, the internal frame. So where I know the weight's going to go down through the, the, the undercarriage legs, that's what I build. I've, I kind of know how much how heavy it's going to be and how much strength I need to build into the Technic frame. That's the first piece, just so I can get it strong enough to support itself. Then from there I start adding the functions, figuring out where I think they're going to go and how I'm going to control things. Um, some are you know axle controlled uh, like these uh, spoilers. Some are uh, Lego string uh, on pulleys. So I figure out the best way to do the, all the functions. Plumb all that in, if you like, and then start trying to cover it. But inevitably, you have to rebuild the thing like three <laughs> times to, to get back to, uh, you know, to actually get everything working. And you mentioned it was a little bit fragile. So how, how do all the different parts of this come together? Do they, does it break apart in sort of modules so you can move it around and stuff? Yeah, all the, the wings come off, the tail planes come off, the fins, the nose, canopies, lots of bits come off. And then it takes about an hour, say, to reassemble once, uh, once I get to a show. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's not too bad. That one's a little bit more fragile, to be honest. Uh, this one came first and I learned a few lessons when I did this one. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you, you, you know, bit by bit, you sort of pick up things and you realize, well, I'm not going to do that again. And you change your ideas for the next time. Right. And I noticed you mentioned this deck earlier as well. You got a lot of these big, uh, like, tile pieces. Yeah. Where'd you get those from? Yeah, all brick-linked. Brick yeah, I, you know, they're like 
dollar fifty each or something, and there's four hundred of them. So it's um, I think there's like sort of maybe eight hundred of these. I, I don't know. A lot a lot of a lot of bulk buying <laughs> went on here. I just clean people out of these completely. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's not something I'm that. In, I'd rather be building planes than carry a deck, but just wanted to do it kind of once to set this plane off. Uh, it's one of my favourite ever planes, so kind of made sense. And I and I did the, the deck crew as well, um, the tow tractor. My good friend Joe Perez designed the crew men, and I I built uh, versions of them. So uh, I'm not a very good figure builder, but he's awesome. They're all uh, um, you can move them around, fully articulated figures. So you can pose them in the launch poses that the deck crew on aircraft carriers do. Right, those are those are really impressive. Yeah, yeah. for such a small scale, he's he's did an amazing job. Yeah. So how did you decide on this skill? Because this these these are definitely bigger than a lot of the military models I see at, at conventions. So is this skill what you've always built in, or did you kind of build up to this over the years? These are both fifteenth scale, um, and the main driver for scale is either the wheel what available wheels you've got which would need to look look scale or to be honest the biggest thing with these two was the missiles limited round bricks and this the tomcat carries three different size missiles so to get all three in in scale there's only one scale that really works and came out 15th which happens to be about the size i wanted to be building in anyway so it's kind of lucky um but that drove the, the scale of these my next plane was going to be a bit bigger scale but it's a smaller plane it's a sea harrier and that's um, that. That will be, you know, uh, the missiles will be slightly bigger. So I use the the next brick up for the missiles on that one. Uh, but that, those are the two really defining factors. That if you don't get them built to get them right, then the plane won't really look a very scale model. My name's Jack Carlson, also known as Big Planes on YouTube, and yeah, so this is the 787 Dreamliner here. This one took quite a bit of time and a lot of effort to get a lot of the compound curves and stuff going on here, but I thought it actually turned out pretty well and was able to make it here to Bricks by the Bay with it, and yeah, so I'll sort of show you around all we got going on here. So first a little bit of historical context, this is the 787-8 Dreamliner. So 
really more of a 21st century aircraft, not too much of the past, but there's a lot going on here that Boeing had to do in order to make it very efficient, more competitive with some of the Airbus offerings. So the wings in general have very uh, slick curve and they have a raked wingtip, which allows it to have a better uh, vertex control at the end than having a winglet, which is something that took a little bit of engineering to figure out, but I'm no professional on aerodynamics, so I'm not sure exactly how that works. And this plane does have, does have flaps, so I'll try to show these to you. Oh, as we come around, sorry, this might be a bit of a hard reach, but the inboard flaps, they work pretty simple, simple mechanism. It just slides right in like that. And then the outboard flaps here, it's very simple as well. You just pull it straight up and in it comes like that. And the flap tracks are just pretty much remain attached to the flap pieces themselves and are more for show. They don't actually have any tracks going on inside of them. And I had to use a lot of very rare elements inside the wing design itself. And getting all these angles to meet up together in one curve really took a lot of effort. And wow, that was quite difficult. So I'm glad that worked out. I had to go to Slovenia to find these uh, older bricks here. I believe they're from the 80s actually, but it worked really well. And something you may notice with the engines is that they have a serrated uh, trailing edge. Now this wasn't actually to reduce the efficiency or to increase the efficiency because these things didn't help the airflow. What it did is it helped reduce the noise of the aircraft, which means it had to have less insulation on the inside, which made the whole thing a lot lighter. So this is the Rolls-Royce Trent 1000, and this did have some problems, this particular engine, but they eventually did smooth them out, and they're dealing with the 737 MAX right now. But I was able to fit a Power Functions M motor inside the engine, and the fan blade can spin. So this is something I really wanted to do, and you can see it next to the minifigure. It's just absolutely <laughs> massive, and these are one of the larger engines. It's actually almost the size of the 737 fuselage, or narrow-body fuselages. So... Yeah, that was very interesting. That's really awesome. Can you tell me, you know, when you decided that you wanted to do the 787, what were some of the challenges that you had never faced before with your other planes? Oh, this thing is just so much sleeker than everything else. That's the problem is that nothing's straight. Nothing's like the wingtips are very curved. The, the hedral is incredibly wide and the thing with the 77 is that when it's in flight the wings really bend upwards it's really quite a sight to see so i tried to get that as much as i could the wings on this plane have a really complicated wing structure to actually get it to look much much more accurate and have the wings go really high off the ground and it actually worked out pretty well and this one this one doesn't have that much warp in the wings like a lot of my other builds and that's something that i'm actually really happy with and the fuselage, I tried to get the fuselage to be smoother because the 787 has a very shiny kind of round fuselage. Most planes do, but the 787 really sort of emphasizes the curves and the, the sort of subtle, the, it's very, very uh, futuristic, if you will. Sure. D so this thing has a detailed interior, right? Yes, it does have an interior. So I guess I'll show you that. We're going to start with the... The tail, well, we're not going to start with the tail, but the tail is pretty much like the front. They're all economy, so I'm going to remove the roof here, and hopefully nothing bad happens. I already sort of loosened the tile up here earlier, so it comes off right here. Tail is good, right? And then up here in the front, comes off, like so. Whoa. And when you do that, the roof does come off. I did arrange this in a 131 configuration. Now, on the real plane, it would be in a 333, but... This would be emulating the 242 uh, configuration, mostly because the minifigures are really wide, so getting them to fit in there at this plane is quite a challenge because they're not proportionally accurate. And I decided to have minifigures instead of having the seat arrangements be accurate, so that's mostly what I did here. And you can see that I do have some figures in there, and you always have that one uh, jerk that reclines his seat back super far. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was trying to get that. And it's not a full flight, but there are some people in there. This guy trying to uh, sip his coffee over there. Looks like a mom with his babe, her baby. And yeah, so I just try to get that. This would be known as the uh, cattle class because you're just there to fill the plane. The airline doesn't make most of its money off of you. So yeah. And more towards the front here. This is where it starts getting a little bit more interesting. I'm going to try to disconnect some bits here because, you know, try, there we go. This all comes off. So if you disconnect it here, disconnect it here. 
Oh, let's see if we can get this to come off. It might be a little tail heavy when I do this, so gotta be a little concerned about that. So when we do that, oh, guess we'll just drop this bit right here. It's all right. We'll put this right here to add a bit of a counterweight. So uh, this right here is the first class area, and yeah, I tried to make this as detailed as I could. We have the privacy partitions here. This would be, normally there would be a little staircase right here to the upper class, or not the upper class, where the sleeping bays were for the flight crew. But instead I just put some cabinets here. Maybe they would store some stuff, I'm not sure. And this right here is the privacy partition where the first class, this was known as the a premium economy in the Norwegian Airlines. And I put this in a 131 configuration. The seats are quite large, but it's not very full either. But you do see we have some fancy business folks traveling. They're a bit uh, more wealthy than the rest of us, or a bit wealthier than the rest of us, so we can't afford to fly up here. But, yeah, I did try to put a couple people up here. The, the laboratories here are a little bit larger. You see the doors do open. This one took a bit of the roof with it, or the roof took a little bit of this laboratory, but you can actually see in there a little bit better now. There is a full toilet and sink. I tried to put those in there. It's a really cramped configuration, but it does work. And up here towards the very front, very, very front. This is the cockpit, and there is a functioning cockpit door. This actually can open and close like this. Works pretty well. And you can fit people up there, so we're just going to pick a random passenger from our area. This guy right here looks like he's suffering, so we'll uh, relieve him from that. And you can see that a minifigure actually can fit up here in the front. I'm not going to fully connect him, but can fit. And I did put a couple of yokes in there, and I tried to put some detailed parts there the best as I could, but... Again, it's Lego, so there's not overly too many parts you can put in there that works. And the doors are on a double hinge system, so they, they do slide in like this, and then slide in all the way, like so. Like that, there you go. And they, when they close like that, it's pretty much like how a real airplane door works, but, yeah, it has, it has to be modified a little bit for Lego. So, yeah. That's cool. What can you tell me about the, the decal on the front windshield? Is that a custom? Yeah, so the front windshield, I went through a lot of different design issues with the front of this nose because it's so slick and the rest of the plane so smooth and stuff that getting a nose that doesn't look terrible is quite difficult. So I just took your standard uh, windscreen piece, and I didn't think it looked good enough, so I just applied a sticker on it <laughs> that seems to work pretty well, actually. Yeah, I actually think it, looks, it makes it look, in my eyes, it looks perfect. Um, so you did a great job sort of transforming that standard, you know, Lego windscreen into something that looks like it really fits this airplane. Um, tell me a little bit, you got Freddie Mercury back there on the back, uh, the back of the plane. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so Freddie Mercury was the person we chose because he seemed to be the most popular on the YouTube channel. Now, I understand he would have been on a Dash 9, but this was the most popular. Everybody wanted to, oh, put Freddie Mercury on the tail. So I did go ahead and do that. And... Uh, Dan Keyes, who comes to this convention or about every year, he actually did the favor and printed the tail. So this, these aren't decals. They're actually printed on there. He used an electronic printer and it pad printed it directly onto the tail. So all these markings on this plane, these are all, uh, all prints. None of these are stickers, which means it's a lot more uh, durable than having a sticker on there would be. That's that's really wonderful. I, I honestly I thought that was a decal back there, but uh, but it is printed. So if you took that apart, would you have each piece of that that emblem of Freddie Mercury's face and then be able to reassemble it? Well, yeah, it'd be kind of like a puzzle, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> At least with a sticker, it won't get under it and ruin it. So yeah, the problem with stickers is they peel a lot. So right. Well, that looks really wonderful. It, You've got a couple other planes over here. Is there anything else you want to say about the 787 before we move on? Well, I would like to say it does have retracting landing gear, but I can't, I can't really demonstrate that right now because it's on the, on the table. But the landing gear does retract, and, oh, yeah, it does have cargo bays doors. So I'm going to try to demonstrate for this to you as best as I can. It, it's sort of a double hinge mechanism, kind of like the doors, but slides are nicely into place like that. Yeah, so... Now I'll open it for you so you can see how it works. I was this is one of the benefits of having printed parts is that you can sort of separate the parts like this. But again, this just comes loose like so, and the door just opens like that. And there is a cargo bay in there. I might know it might be kind of hard to see, especially on camera. But you can fit stuff. I know you could if you wanted to load some pallets in there or maybe just some loose luggage. But I think on the larger flights and larger planes, they would load pallets instead of individual luggage. So yeah. 
That's that's great. Uh, I love the attention to detail that you make. You know, with kind of the way the, the with the way the doors work. Uh, you know, that definitely reminds me of the way actual plane doors work. And you've talked about the interior with the seats and whatnot. What what can you tell me about the light effects that you've got on this plane? Okay, yeah. So the lights on this plane, these are all brick stuff lights. So it's using the brick stuff system. And what I basically did is I put the main battery pack. There's two battery packs. There's one for the lights and one for the engines. The lights is using a triple A's and the engines is a lipo so I can recharge it. And what I did is I ran some wires out through the wings all the way out here. And there's one going right here and one out here on the end. So this would be, I guess, just the main illumination light. I'm, I guess I have no professional on the planes and all their lights and stuff. But I'm guessing these are just the navigation lights. So I tried to include those on there as best as I could. And it also does have a strobe light on the top and bottom. It's a little bit disassembled here, so it's kind of hard to see. But there is one on the bottom there that's flashing on the table that's still going. So glad to see it's still going. That's really cool. You want to take us and show us uh, these other couple planes over here? Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll show you what we have over here. All right, so this is the 727, and this is the 200 model, which means it's the more stretched of the bunch, and it's in the Southwest livery. Again, this is printed. Our good friend Dan Keyes printed that, too, so this isn't coming off, but Southwest did actually operate some 727s, in the mid-80s, they leased them from another airline, I don't really remember which one it is, to operate some longer routes, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, this one has a lot of the same features as the other one, but it's just a lot smaller. So up towards the front here, I'll just start with the cargo door since that's what we finished with last time. The 737 doesn't have this, but this one does. Let's see if it works. Got to kind of push it in where it's like this. There we go. And like that. So that's how that closes nice and neatly nice flush and there is room in there though I did have to put some ballast bricks in the front of this because it's quite tail heavy even though this nose is so long it is quite tail heavy and this one does have a t-tail and a center engine in the tail so this is a tri-jet which is one of the things that was really sort of cool and stood out about the 727 is that it had three engines and the third engine is actually in the tail cone itself and this is just an S duct where the air is taken in so, yeah, that was something that was really cool. That is cool. I love the color scheme on this plane. You know, Southwest, before they introduced kind of that purple periwinkle into the color scheme. So this really reminds me of, like, the few flights I would take or picking up my dad at the airport when I was a kid. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I really like the desert gold livery. This was something that you don't see as much anymore, and you might occasionally see it at some airports, but especially on the 727, I thought it was a really neat look. That's great. What about the uh, Lufthansa down here? Okay, so the Lufthansa, this is a 737-500, so it's the smallest 737 variant. It's part of the Classic series, so don't worry, it's not a Max. And uh, this one does have a lot of the same features as the other two, but again, it's much smaller. So it does have powered engines, and I tried to uh, show those the best by putting a little spinner on it so you could see it. But this was really challenging because I needed to find a part that worked really well for the intake, the, the gray part around the intake, and those parts just fit perfectly. So... I also was able to just barely fit in the disc piece for the jet engine turbine, so that worked really well too. And this one does have an interior. It's a little easier to get to than the 787, but I guess I'll show you that. So what the way this works is that you can just pull off the entire roof, whoa, just oh, like that. That's great. And yeah, this one's better for shows, I guess, because you can actually see it. But yeah, it does have the sausage doors, which have become kind of a bit of a joke on the channel now. But they used to be red. I made them black because it blends in a little bit better. And this isn't exactly how Lufthansa would have it laid out, but it's kind of close where they would have their premium seats up in the front and then the cattle class in the back. These are in a 1-1 configuration, even though it should probably be a 2-2 or even a 3-3 with more leg room. But since, again, since minifigures are kind of fat, that's what we ended up with. We have the cape right here which, again, is being used as a privacy partition between the business class and the cattle class. And back here, I was able to include a couple of emergency exits because, you know, we have to stay up to date with safety codes. So, uh, yeah, those come out. And it's just it's a fairly basic assembly. It's just a one-by-two brick with a panel on the top. But, yeah, it fits right in there. And I tried to include as much in this one as I could. So... There's no lavatory up here towards the front, even though there should be, but that's, again, more space constraint. 
But the cockpit on this one it is fully detailed, and there are a couple of yokes in there to control the plane. Though it's quite cramped on this one, so you might struggle to fit a figure in there. But it is in there, and it's about how it would be. And back here, at the very back here, we could kind of roll the plane forward. So I can show you this a little bit better. It's an uneven table, so it's hard to just demonstrate this. There are a couple laboratories back here, and the doors, again, do function on these. So it's hard to sort of show that. It's very cramped. And I did try to put a little galley in the back. I know there should be a little bit more, but again, this is a very small plane, and the 737 galley is usually pretty cramped, so it's pretty accurate. The doors on this one are kind of like the 787, but a little simpler. They just use a, two uh, battle droid arms, and they pop right out, like so. Open. Like that. This is cool. These are all really great, Jack. Would you say that these three planes are, are fairly well scaled to one another. Do you pay attention to that when, you, when you're building? Yeah, so all these planes are around 136 to 138 scale. I try to keep that because it's about uh, half or twice, I think it's twice as large as 172, which is really good for finding decals because that's a standard model size and also good for finding blueprints because you only have to multiply it times two. But yeah, I try to keep these all around minifigure scale, so minifigures go really well with them. Some people find minifigure scale more around 140, 145, but I usually build a little bit larger because it leaves me more room for flaps and, and uh, seats and stuff, and that's something that, yeah, I usually try to keep at the same scale. That's great. How long have you been building planes? Uh, I would say for about four years now. I originally started doing cars a little bit, but I like planes a little bit better because they're bigger and oftentimes... They haven't been done as much as cars a lot, so I started doing planes about four years ago. I used to do military a lot, and I sort of uh, off-shot out into civilian. And so that's really what I've been doing a lot of lately, is civilian aircraft. And I've done the 747 in the past before the, the, let me think, the Constellation. And I'm hoping to be able to do a 707 soon here, along with some other Airbus aircraft, because I know that's also hotly demanded. But yeah, planes have been always something I've enjoyed. And I guess you could call I'm a bit of a ad, av geek, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Cody Osell. I'm with Brickmania, and I designed a C-130 model. It's So we're from Minnesota, and our local Air Force Reserve is called the Flying Vikings. And they gave us a phone call and they invited us out to their um, place to check out their C-130s and they asked us to build one out of Lego. So, that's so you were able to see one of these kind of in person before you actually started on the model? Yeah, they took okay. us through all the features of it, told us some of their stories, and we took a lot of pictures. They said, nothing's off limits, just <laughs> we're happy to share any information with you. So this is a 1992 model. So if you want to then kind of take us through the, the different details and kind of how the model came together for you? Sure. So I built this um, for display only. Typically, Brickmania, we build kits um, with instructions, stickers, printed stuff. So this was just to kind of map it out and see if maybe in the future we do make a kit version of it. So I had uh, about 80 hours into this build over over two week period and I was really rushing to get it done because we had to come to the show in Brick Fair Virginia here so as soon as I finished it we packed it up and put it on the on the van to come down here from Minnesota so I had to plan ahead a lot for structure because it's it's just a big hollow tube in the center of the C-130 so it can fit a lot of vehicles a lot of cargo inside so I started with a very rigid technic structure uh, for the base and kind of mapped out how the fuselage, you know, because it's just, it's really round. So I had to get the spacing right and figure out how I'm going to connect it to the base and have it be strong enough to travel without falling apart. So I used a lot of technic beams, technic bricks, and pretty much every single pinhole I stuck a pin in. <laughs> so there's over a thousand pins. <laughs> this thing it. isn't falling apart or anything anytime soon. Yeah, and it came here just, I mean, I was disassembled. Certain yeah. aspects of it I, I built and designed so it would come apart and be put back together easily. And I tried to do it in locations where the actual airplane separates. Okay. So 
from the wing or uh, from the first engine on uh, the actual airplane, they can separate the wings off. So that's where I made mine separate, so it fits in a box better. And then I take the stabilizer off of the tail, and then the tail separates from the rest of it. So it just comes apart in about five pieces. And I would say it's probably about 20 pounds worth of Lego. And you can pick it up from the wing. At least I think I can from this side of the table, maybe not. You can pick it up with one hand anyways. <laughs> Sometimes little pieces pop off. If I'm on the other side of the table, I can do it, but I'll do it with two hands. But it's it's very strong. It's very swooshable. We yeah, call that's amazing that you can pick it up by the wings like that. Yeah. <laughs> so then you've got this front section here. You've got some, it's always, the, the cockpit always has some crazy angles and stuff with these planes, and getting that with Lego isn't easy. So how would you overcome that challenge? Uh, that That's a very small portion of the build, and it took me a good percentage of the build just to figure that out about 16 hours just in the cockpit I wanted to use a Lego windscreen um, as one part to accomplish that look but I just I wasn't pleased with it so I had to brick build it and use a couple different panels um, to get the windscreen done correctly or as correctly as I could and yeah I guess just the stepping down of the curved slopes trying to get it right. I base everything off of 135th scale blueprints. Okay. So, so you had a chance to look at the real plane and then you have the blueprints back where, where you're actually building it. Yeah, I had a lot of reference pictures. They took us around inside of the cockpit. I didn't have time to do all the cockpit details internally yet, but there is space inside. Um, so once I get back to the shop, maybe we'll add some printed elements, do all the dashboards, all the controls on the inside, and really, really deck out the interior. And then obviously you've got the movement incorporated in here uh, with the, the propellers. So where, how does that work and where's all that kind of equipment in the plane that keeps that running? So this is all 100% Lego parts. So even the motors are the Lego power function motors. Okay. So there's one for each engine. And I wired them all together through the wings. And then inside I just left the wire dangling so I could attach it to a Lego battery pack, rechargeable Lego battery pack. Mm -hmm. So it's just all running off of one battery pack. Uh, for display, we're thinking about putting it in one of the Brickmania stores for display model just to have them running constantly. We'll figure out a USB connection just to plug it into the wall so we don't have to change batteries constantly. <laughs> Somebody isn't switching out batteries yeah. all the time. Right. It fits uh, two Brickmania Humvees on the inside. Okay. It fits a uh, Brickmania Striker vehicle and the uh, Brickmania Sheridan tank. Yeah. So you designed it so that you could have that playability of putting all those different vehicles in there. Right. So if we ever make a kit version, we might make the AC-130 gunship. And that would be a bit of a redesign. So I built this for display so you can't really get inside to play with it. But if it were a kit, then I would figure out a way that you could take sections apart and be able to you know, set up minifigures inside and, and whatnot and be able to play with some of the features of it. So I have the cargo doors on the back. And if you look inside, there's the battery pack is on the inside, so you can't see all the way down the interior. But I, I made the floor resemble all the um, places where you can attach straps and cords and things to hold down the cargo. Other than that, it's not really super detailed, but they can add things like a lot of chairs for paratroopers, um, fold-down chairs, things like that. And on the, the doors on the side here, they work on a roller system and the real aircraft. So I built a way to simulate the roller system and the doors. Okay. It's not on a roller system, the Lego version, but it's using uh, minifig uh, mechanical arms to at least illustrate that that's how they slide yeah. open like that. It creates that same effect. Sure. And this on the back here, they were, we asked what were these bulges because not every C-130 has a bulge on the back here. And the term, I think you call it Larcom, L-A-I-R-C-M. And it's, he explained it to us like it's a Star Wars thing. It, it shoots a laser out at an incoming missile to blind the missile, so it loses its tracking on the C-130. Oh. So it, it's a very impressive airplane uh, in real life. It's gone through a lot of updates. I think this is the H model. 
the J model is much longer, and I'm glad I didn't have to build the J model. <laughs> this is a beast as is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and they were telling us that C-130 can actually hold its own against a fighter jet. They, they constantly train to maneuver around, so if they get attacked by a fighter jet, they know how to not get shot really? down and defend themselves better. And it's just the fact that this is much slower than a jet, so as long as you keep the jet in front of you, they can't ever get around behind you and shoot you down. And they also have a lot of flares that they can deploy. Um, some people like to call it the Archangel flare d display um, to help uh, counteract incoming missiles. Yeah, I mean, all the technology these planes are equipped with is just amazing. It's, it's fascinating to hear about that. So then on, on your plane you build here, how wide is the wingspan? I think it's about 45 inches, which uh, is the largest airplane I've ever built. I built the B-17 underneath this display here. And then, so that helped a lot having built something large prior to building this. I knew a lot of things I could correct and make stronger. And the answer, I guess, came in a lot of Technic beams and Technic bricks. Sure. So one of the functions I was able to create in the time, the time allotted was the extendable flaps. So they come out and bend down. And the rest of it should do the same thing along the wing. I just didn't have time to create that feature. I have an idea of how to do it. And it would work in a similar fashion as this, but just creating the angle and keeping the wings strong enough. Uh, I just decided to opt out of that for this design. Maybe in the future I'll update it so it'll do that. Uh, the rudder functions, the elevators, and I made the landing gear go up and down. I hit some mechanisms, one on each side. So if you spin these, the landing gear retracts directly up into the airplane. Okay. And the front one is more of a manual technique. You just pull a pin out and have the landing gear retract up under the door. Yeah, so you're so. able to design it so you can hide all those features inside and it makes it look a, a decent looking design outside but still have all those features. Correct. Yep. Hi, my name's Jack and I built the B-29 Super Fortress here. And I really like this one because I like how it incorporates the Davis wing design, which many of these planes for the time did have. It was a new thing. Now this one does come with the crew. This is sort of a famous scene because it has the Enola Gay picture. I tried to base it off of this. Now the real plane is probably, I think it's chrome, but chrome is very expensive or you would have to spray paint it, which you'd be throwing a lot of money out the window doing that. So just settled with gray, even though most of the planes are gray, which is unfortunate. But this one I didn't go too colorful. The tail was gray. I was kind of disappointed that you didn't have more decals that made it look a little better, uh, better. But I might change the name of the plane one day. But I just like Nola Gay because it's more iconic and most people know the plane. Yeah. Got the bomb here that was dropped from it. I think it's Little Boy. Yeah. It's got all the things. It will fit in, if there were bomb bays on this plane, which I couldn't because it had to. This is all filled with weight because it's very tail heavy. Um, this would be able to fit in there because it is four or five studs wide, where this is eight studs, so that would fit. The propellers do have do not rotate, but that's because the w wings are actually in this plane it's really complicated. They have to actually have Technic pieces that hinge them upward to fight the warp that wants to go down, because it, everything wants to warp down, just kind of like this. This one you can let it warp down, but this one. The, the real plane's wings are supposed to go up, and so you actually have to compensate for the it warping down and get Technic pieces and hinge it up, and it eventually will get higher here than it is here, which makes sense. It kind of helps if the landing gear is down there, but other than that, you don't really get much help from the plane itself. And since the real plane's engines are heavier than the tail, usually that's how the real plane balances itself, but this one, the engines don't weigh anything and the tail weighs a ton, so... That would be sort of a little offset there. Not a huge on the crew, but just sort of threw people with tan shirts and brown legs on the right next to the plane and sort of did that. Made it a little buggy here, even though I'm pretty sure that wasn't there. It's just an accessory. Yeah, and I, I do love the wing design there. It looks like you decided to tile this one as well, so I think it adds that kind of extra sleek kind of detail. Yeah, I, liked, I used the curve. A lot of these curve slopes here, 
I really like these curved slopes. I use them on the back of the wings. I use them on the fuselage. I just use them on everything. So, yeah, I really, I love those pieces. <laughs> They're not cheap, but I think it really helps make the plane look better. It's like a pipe with wings on it. That's sort of what I feel like it is. So, yeah, that's kind of like the B-36 back there. It's a pipe with wings, essentially, <laughs> that carries an H-bomb. So. <laughs> Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the historical significance of the Enola Gay and, and, and this plane? Yeah, the Enola Gay dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, or however you're supposed to pronounce that. But, yeah, it was very, very, the Japanese were expecting it, I'd say, but they dropped the first one, and they still didn't give up. But then, I think the second plane was named Boxcar, dropped the other one, Fat Man, right? And then at that point, I think a little while after that, they surrendered. But they, we had run out of atomic bombs by the time they dropped the second one. And we were just sort of hoping that they didn't think we ran out. <laughs> so, yeah, I used a lot of techniques here to get this built on the side and down. And a lot of curves and got them little windows right here. So, yeah, these pieces are really good for the bubbles like that you shoot out of. These are supposed to be the turrets that are more retracted. So... Yeah, so that goes. Yeah, get the little details in there. That's that's really neat. Now, does the landing gear move on this, or? Yeah, you can angle it this way, I guess, if you wanted to turn it. And it's pretty sturdy. It does retract quite a bit on this one. That one retracts. This retracts, but it's really, really heavy. So I don't think I. Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, well, that's that's really cool. Thank you. I think it turned out very nice. About six years ago, I wanted to build up my favorite airplane. Uh -huh. So I tried to figure out whether I was going to do it in balsa or concrete or whatever it was. And I settled on Lego. So I spent about six months um, thinking about what the airplane was going to be, which was a 777. And then number two, how to construct it. Um, and what I did was I got a scale, um, a scale rendering, if you will, on a plotter so that it would come out approximately the way the smallest it could be with bricks, normal bricks, and this was it. So once I did that, I started to work, and I probably made one big mistake. I started the plane from the top down, and it wasn't until about a year later, I was halfway through it, and I was running into real trouble, and I called. Uh, I, I spoke to somebody at Lego who was a builder, and he said, stop, halt, you gotta start from the ground up. So anyway, I finished this, um, took about 500 hours, took about five years, and um, here it is. And then I finally found a place to get lights, which was basically a, a brick light company, you know, that's here, and uh, put those in. So now this is sort of complete. Secondly, I'm working on a, uh, an orca, is basically flying through the air and uh, grabbing a seal. And it's of a similar scale as this yes, Boeing? Yes, it's, it's uh, seven feet long. And it was just finished this week after many years of procrastination. <laughs> because unfortunately, as much as I love Lego and as sure. much as I love building, it doesn't... Um, every once in a while you get discouraged because you run into problems or whatever yeah. it is. And lots of help from lots of associates in the AFL group and Lego, etc. As to my past, um, I basically have been in the construction business for a long time and um, and also in the computer business. And I'm now sort of retired, but I have uh, uh, a number of, of offers. I'm building a number of pieces for people to uh, for the future. Hello, my name is Jack Carlson, more known as Big Planes on YouTube, and this here is a very big plane. This is a 747 passenger plane dash 100. It was really one of the first 747s off the line. It was operated by Pan American Airlines or Pan Am. They were the original uh, operators of the 747. They were one of the key reasons why the 747 was made. And this thing is pushing the limits again of what a plane could be in width because of how heavy it is and how much structural just support it needs on the inside and I would say the most difficult parts of this plane were definitely supporting wings 
supporting the fuselage, it's supporting the landing gear, which do need to retract for transport. So the wing is all supported by central wing box. It does use a Technic system, and the wings do hold themselves up pretty well. The engines are decently far off the ground, and it was very difficult to do because the wings, um, there's a spar that comes out right here, and that does interfere a bit with the flaps. It also needed flap tracks on the insides of the wings in order to operate correctly. So I had to work around the flaps, which is a little difficult, but, you know, easy enough. And the landing gear down there towards the bottom, which you can't really see from this angle, was also challenging because I had to put it, place it right here so it could support the wings, but also get the go directly into the point where the plane was the strongest, which is the central wing box. So that was definitely something that was very challenging with this plane. And there goes that. I broke a lot of pieces when building the landing gear, and that was <laughs> fun because I went through about 10 of those Technic pieces. It has the, the axle that goes through it. It snapped quite a few of those. Oh, wow. And yeah, it has a set of landing gear on the fuselage and one on each wing. So there's, I believe, 16 in total on the plane, including the two nose gear up towards the front. And that was something that was fun, I'll just say, to do, but it does work pretty well. It can take a fair bit of abuse now, and I have found a way to distribute the weight better on the wing landing gear so they can take a little more abuse than they did before. And yeah, it's more convention ready. The plane also has a full interior, which <laughs> kind of gave us troubles with the, the structural integrity of the fuselage because it may have wanted to droop quite a bit due to a full interior. So I'm going to sort of take the roof off so you yeah. can see that in here. Is this the first time you've included an interior on one of your planes? Uh, yeah, for a passenger plane, this is the first okay. time there's been a full interior on it. So the roof comes off in one piece, set down over here. And that's the main economy section. And back there, if I can reach back here, see if I can get all the way back here, the tail section can come off as one piece as well. Where we've got some more detailed stuff. Then, of course, all the way up here at the front, we have this, which can show us the cockpit. Sorry to let you guys get over there. See cockpit. There's a couple of pilots there. I know one's from World War II, but it was a standby <laughs> pilot, right? <laughs> you have to have time ready. So I'll leave that off for now. And the upper lounge, this is what made this plane so special at its time because it was big. It was the first wide-body aircraft. It has two aisles here that run down the center compared to the normal planes of the time, like the 707 or probably like 727 or DC-8 or such, they had a single aisle, and I'd break it off the seats, and they wanted a plane that was larger. So originally they wanted a double-decker design, but they ended up going with a, a larger fuselage or twin aisle design. But what this plane did have up here towards the front was its iconic hump, since this is a 747. And the reason they went with this hump was because originally this was going to be a freighter aircraft because it was going to be replaced supposedly by the supersonic transports of the time. So the hump was there so they could hinge the nose upward to be able to get access to it so the pilots could be up here. So that's how why the hump was there and the origin of the hump. But then when they realized that this was the plane that they needed because the SLS, or not the SLS, the supersonic transport aircraft wouldn't work, they then sold these planes to many airlines. And this right here is the upper lounge. I'm going to try to disconnect it here for a minute here. Yeah. As you can see, it is connected on both sides. And this does have some decals on it, the Pan Am, to let you know it's Pan Am. Is that all custom stickering then, the decals? Yeah, a lot of custom stickers. I could never seem to get them right, but I did find some clear sticker paper this time. Gotta get the bubbles there. They kind of help you get the decals on there. Yeah. But I also used some techniques to get the windows. Some of these models had all windows here, but this is a 100, so it would only have three windows here. And in here we have the, the upper lounge area, which has a lot of orange in it. And right here, this is a drink cart. Got some stuff up there, maybe a little cake and some champagne and wine, coffee, yeah, up here. And got a croissant and some couches up there. This is definitely something that gave this plane a little bit more of a unique flavor because it was, it had a lounge in it. Nothing at the time really did. And you could go up the staircase, which I will show you here in a minute. So we'll put this down over here. And then this section right here, I'm going to have to move some stuff out of the way here. This whole section here can be removed and set down over here, which reveals some more stuff up here towards the front of the aircraft. And what made this plane really special for the time was it had a spiral staircase right here that would lead up to the lounge. And getting that was sort of interesting. I used a flex tube and a bunch of those clips with tiles on it. 
and it actually worked out really well to get a spiral staircase. That was something that I had a lot of fun with. And then up here towards the front, we have the first class seats, which are different color to indicate that they're probably made out of a better material and they're much more spread apart. And of course, up here we have some that are much nicer. May not be the exact configuration, but mostly the first class would sit up here and their lounge would be up in the upper section because that's really what they wanted to do. Very nice first class seats in this plane. Most of the plane is economy, but there is some other detail in the center of the aircraft because this plane was much larger than most others. We have two laboratories here, restrooms. They're a little larger. The first class would probably have used these restrooms. We also have a galley up here that would have been used for serving the first class folks. And there, there is a, well, I believe there's a cream pie in there, but I can't see it right now. We have a holder, carrot holder and a faucet right there. Each one of these doors does function and it does open. All the bathroom doors do open or laboratory doors do open completely so you can get full access to the inside. That was a key feature that I did like to have. And the doors here all do function correctly. There are 10 of them on this aircraft. So this one here this is an example. It would just slide right in like this and fold right in. And they all do that. They all function basically the same way. And when I originally put this on the YouTube thing or on the YouTube, I had them opening this way. And a lot of people said that was backwards. So I did recently go and fix them. Now they open the correct way, which is forward. And a lot of times they would open this way, try to open like that up there, there it goes. But yeah, so this is something that I did like to include on this plane, functioning doors. And there are 10 of them on this aircraft. It's quite a large plane. So that was <laughs> something that was a key feature I really wanted to include. This one does have a two, three, two seat configuration. There are two seats here three seats here and two seats there. On the real aircraft, it would have been three, four, three, or some aircraft nowadays on the same aircraft, they would have three, five, three. And I had to do two, three, two due to Lego scale because Lego figures are a little larger than most figures. When it comes you like to give your mini pigs a little space to, to spread out a little bit in the plane. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And all of them will fit in here. You will be able to fit mini figures in every single seat on this aircraft. They're gonna be cramped, but they will fit that's just exactly how they were on the real plane. You can obviously fit more of them up here towards the front. That's something that the first class do get over the rest of the plane, but I'm pretty happy with that. And this plane is very large, as I mentioned earlier. It's about six feet long, very long, and about five and a half feet wide. And supporting, and supporting something that large can be quite challenging. So yeah, that's pretty interesting. And further back up here, this is main economy stuff up here. There will be separated a little bit by entrances and galleys and laboratories, but right here, you can see that there are four more laboratories right here. Like in the first glass area, they all do open and have functioning doors that do work. And there is a little cheese slope in there to represent a toilet. Again, very cramped space, so it's kind of hard to get the detailing in there perfectly, but that was something I did want to include on this plane since it is quite a large plane. And if we move a little bit further back, we can see that there are some more economy seats. And then back here, you can see that this is the main galley area. And in this container right here, there is an apple, because why not, right? And we have some uh, equipment sort on the walls and stuff, some sinks. And this is something that I did want to include in this plane, because a lot of times when people build large Lego planes, they don't include an interior at all, because it's so hard to support a plane this large. So that's something that I really did want to include. And in the very back, more laboratories, like up here in the front, basically four more that would have been kind of cramped, but they're in the back of the aircraft. Again, four more doors, so they would have had access to them. So yeah, it's the main part of this plane. It does have fully functioning flaps on this aircraft, and I'm gonna try to uh, do it for you here. They did get beat up quite a bit on transport, so I'm not sure if this will work completely as it's supposed to, but they are trifold flaps. So this one here would fold up like this. This next flap here, like I said, I'm not sure how these did during transport, would fold up like that, and then fold into the body like this, and the whole thing would fold in like that. So it does remain flush with the aircraft, and that was definitely a feature that was very important. It took a long time to design something that would fold up and actually slide into it, and a lot had to be done. And these are remained in the down position because they're quite, it takes a while to fold them up because you gotta make sure the flap tracks are up. And oh yeah, on the flap tracks, on the very bottom of the aircraft, these can also be raised just like they would. These are just for show on this aircraft as I break them. These are mostly for show on this aircraft, but they, on the real aircraft, the, the 
flat mechanisms would have been stored in these flat tracks, and that's how they would have lowered and raised. And on my model, again, they're just there for show, but they do give it more of the aircraft look that this thing should have. Again, the trifle flaps, incredibly complicated uh, pieces of this plane. A lot of newer model planes don't have the complete trifold flaps, but this plane did, and that's something that is very recognizable about the 747 and that I really wanted to capture on this plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's a great build. Thanks for the explanation of how it all came together. It's fascinating to see kind of your process there and how you were able to include so many details. So I'm glad you were able to bring this giant thing out to the show here. And thanks so much for chatting with me about it. Appreciate it. Nicholas Kramer, um, I kind of got my own thing with NK Custom Bricks. Started about three years ago and just kind of been building since. Um, this is the F-18, the Legacy Hornet. Um, just finished that last week uh, for this, for Brickworld. Um, for me, I love putting as much detail into stuff, um, trying to find as many pictures of the actual aircraft and everything, um, and trying to find it and make it as functional and realistic as possible. So, I, like I said, I pack details in. Um, and the more function, I mean, the, obviously the cooler it is. The, uh, the brick stuff, the lights, I mean, I had those custom made for this, and I think it just it just adds some pop and makes it look look pretty cool. It definitely makes it stand out in the back there. So uh, how did you incorporate the lights into the build there? Uh, the rear section of the aircraft is actually hollow, so that way the circuit boards and the wires and everything can get built in there. And then he, he ended up doing the, the, the actual custom wiring for the lights themselves and then just a matter of tearing apart the build to getting everything to fit inside. And it is what it is. <laughs> now, are there any other functions or kind of playability features here? Um, a lot of the stuff, I try to make the, the cockpit detailed, the refueling probe goes up and down, the doors, the gears retract, um, all the control surfaces function. So I guess the more, the more detail, so. Yeah. Are you able to pick it up or is that kind of fragile or? Yeah, I just. I gotta be careful of the wiring though. See how the landing gear kind of all folds up and everything? Yep. And then the wingtips actually will fold up. Um, the speed brakes, rudders, ailerons, flaps, everything is functional. Yeah, that's fantastic. So when you start on this build, what part of the build did you start from as you kind of wanted to get the scale right and make it look like the, the real plane? I actually started with the landing gear first. Okay. Um, landing gear and the engines, um, that's where that engine actually came from. Um, but with the detail, it's even with the small stuff, that's where I started is the details and then the rest of the aircraft or whatever the build is kind of gets modeled from there. Does it stay together pretty well when you travel to a show? Yeah, this is the first show it's been to. I literally just finished it on Tuesday. Um, got the lights put in, and uh, it, it traveled pretty well. It's it's definitely a display model, not a you know, play with oh, model. Yeah. <laughs> and then the base is also a nice addition. So how do you decide when you make a plane like this if you're going to do a base or not for it? Random. <laughs> just wanted to try something different with the the the, uh, the carrier deck, and just as I'm looking at different pictures of the aircraft, you know, I see the black jet blast doors and deflectors, and I was like, oh, let's give that a try. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's a fantastic build. I'm Ty Wilkinson, TIE Fighter 07 on Flickr, and uh, this is my KC-10 extender. So basically, this plane I was able to tour at an air show near me a couple years ago, and um, I actually want to go into the Air Force, and this is one of the planes that i kind of hoping I can fly. Um, it's a it's a refueling plane, so aerial refueling missions. Um, I've got an F-16 work in progress there, and when it's done, I want to be able to try and like hook the two up so that you can kind of get that uh, refueling effect, like midair. And uh, yeah, it, it's the largest refueling tanker that the Air Force has. I forget exactly how many gallons of fuel it holds. I'm sure it's quite a lot. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of fuel. Um, and let's see, they're, they're basically kind of almost converted civilian airliners. Like sometimes you'll see these as uh, FedEx transport or like UPS. Um, even some commercial airlines have them. 
And so when, when you started on this, uh, did you sketch out or blueprint or anything, uh, the plane, or was it pretty much just looking at photos of it? Um, actually, I, I found some blueprints online and then scaled them and printed them out on like a bunch of different pieces of 8x11 paper and taped them all together. And so I had all the blueprints um, to get the scaling just right for this because it is, it is pretty much minifigure scale or as close as I could get. It looks like you've got a bit of an interior in there. What's that like inside there? Yeah, so the interior, the, the top of the um, of the whole plane of the fuselage is not for fuel. It's actually for cargo, so it, it's kind of a dual-purpose aircraft. And um, the, the interior there, it's basically just hollow for most of it um, with a little bit of detailing the floor because, I mean, that's how the real thing is. It's pretty bland. And then at the very back here... There's the uh, refueling boom area, and there's kind of this room that you take some steps down into, and there's some seats down there, and I actually included all that detail. I mean, you can't see it now because it's kind of hard to get to, but um, yeah, all that's in there with the, the little joysticks and stuff to control the boom, and uh, yeah, I might be able to fit a couple figs in the cockpit. It'd probably be a bit tight, but <laughs> yeah. And then there's pretty much all gray pieces here. So were any of these difficult to find in that color to achieve the, the, the color look that you wanted? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I got a lot of the pieces here last year, actually. Um, a lot of the slopes from the bulk brick. And that was really helpful to get it all in one place and not have to pay shipping on BrickLink. Sure. Uh, but yeah, BrickLink was another great source of parts, obviously. Um, how strong is the build? Can you pick it up and swoosh it around at all? Um, it it might be sushable. I don't know. I don't really want to try because <laughs> the wings are a bit fragile because of the connection. It's a uh, kind of like a a compound angle there, so that to get get the right sweep. But I'm, the fuselage is real solid. I can pick that up, but the wings might fall off. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's a really impressive build, and I think you captured the, the plane design very nicely there. So thanks so much for chatting with me about it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jack, and this is the B-36. I know not many people have done B-36s before, so I thought that would be fun to do. This one has motorized, but I'm not going to turn it on right now because it probably needs some new stuff going on in there. But yeah, this is real fun. See, has the bomb bay and people in the cockpit right there. So, yeah. There's only four of them left in existence, okay. and I've been to two of them, part of the <laughs> four left. May one day see a third one. Um, this is the Goblin. That one's also sort of interesting because it actually was made to fit inside the B-36's bomb bay. The wings would fold up, and it would actually go inside of this. You could either have two of these bombs or one of these and one of these, so, so your options there. That's that's really impressive. Does does the bomb bay open up on the bottom, or, or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, you can actually open and close these bomb bays. There's two bomb bays right here, so yeah, like that. Um, the F-86 over here is also interesting. It has, oh, I made this little thing that's I don't know. I think these are like the do something with the battery, or I don't know. I don't I'm not too technical about that. But that's like the air brakes here and. The swept wing, I used one of these Y pieces that I used on the propellers for the back to get that swept wing. So that's sort of interesting. The B-17 here actually is modeled off of one from Castle Air Base. And the Virgin's Delight. Um, has like the red engines and, you know, that. All of my builds have the cockpits bit, uh, built into them. So you can take the top piece here off and you can see the insides of the cockpits so got like seats in there and levers and all the good stuff mm -hmm. to control you can actually fit people in these cockpits which is yeah, so you've got all, all the different details in there and then i guess coming back to your b36 back here this is such a massive build how how wide is the the wingspan on this uh, about five and a half feet okay. i might i might make it bigger because it's not exactly on target but yeah it's close enough for me and it looks like you've got uh, a lot of tiling on there. What's the, what's the structure like, and how did you kind of come up with the design for this? Were there drawings, or how, how do you do these when, when you're working on these planes? Well, for these, I usually, um, for the planes, you start with the beam, 
a big beam that goes through the front. I mean, obviously you can't do that with the B-52 over there, but this one, so it's just more of a straight wing. It's sort of rainbow on the inside because why bother with gray pieces? Um, I, for, when I first built it, it was all plates, but then I got a hold of the tiles and I thought, well, why not? Because this is smooth. And I think this plane suits it better. These tiles are expensive, so I was lucky yeah. right now on that one. So that was really fun with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's understandable. So when you when you move these builds around, how does that work? Do they break down for transportation or? Well, I wasn't very smart when I built this one. This one's one solid thing. I mean, the nose here can come off, and the engines come off, the tail comes off, but it's really sturdy. It just barely fits in our car. <laughs> it's sort of. I made these little boxes to go around the landing gear, so it could get bounced around, but the landing gear will stay protected. Because if we lose the landing gear, it becomes an ordeal not to have it like fall off and you have to hold the plane and try to stick it back on it's just not fun so you just try to protect the landing gear on it right and when you're working on a build like this i see you've got kind of a photo of the real thing here do you base it are you looking at photos of it a lot as, you, as you're working on the build or how does that work yeah and i've seen a couple in real life there kind of get a feel for how big they are a lot of times you can actually look at the blueprints or the drawings of the actual builds or on the build the actual planes and okay it's like of 200 and something feet wide and then you have to scale it right to how many um, plates wide it, wide it should be and how long it should be and then decide what pieces work best for that and yeah a lot of, a lot of thought goes into the planning process before you actually start sticking bricks together to build it so I thought that's an important part of it. You can't just start sticking things together because then you realize you should have made a bigger mistake. <laughs> exactly. And you've got so many gray pieces here. Where do you source those from? Is that BrickLink? Or? Uh, a lot of BrickLink, yeah. There's also a Lego store in there and if you get lucky you might find these tiles at the Lego store. Remember one time we found a downtown Disney Lego store hat and we like rushed down here. It was like a <laughs> line of people looking at them trying to get them. And, oh God. Was, now they've got a bunch of these. The dark gray tiles are really hard to find for some reason. I haven't found any of those at the Lego store, and they're quite expensive on BrickLink, so I don't tile my dark gray planes very much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Originally, this wasn't tiled, but then when I found those tiles, I quickly tiled it because I think it looks better with the tile. Yeah, I think it turned out really nicely. And so what kind of inspires you to do all these builds? You've got several massive Lego plane builds here. Is this just something you've always been interested in, or how how'd you decide to start doing these types of builds? Well, I originally started with the B-24 over there, the witchcraft, because I went to the see the real plane in real life. It was very interesting. And then I just sort of go, started going to other air bases, like Castle and Mayher and Mather and March. And they had Castle at this. I thought, oh, that's a cool plane. Why hasn't anybody built one of those yet? So then once I saw nobody really built one, I was like, okay, I'll do that. And then after I did that, I thought, well... I don't do that. So the the constellation at the end there is my newest one. Kind of quickly built an airport to kind of go with it. Cause I'm like, well, it's more interesting with an airport, so why not? This one here is the U2 Dragon Lady, and it's sort of an interesting plane. This is the one that flew over Russia in the late '60s, and I'm pretty sure it's the one that got shot down. Not this particular plane, but the kind of plane. It's a stealth plane, or. It just, it's stealthy in the way that it just flies so high that they thought it couldn't get shot down. But it's a reconnaissance plane, and it takes pictures. So I'm not a professional on what it can do, but I do sort of know some things about it. This particular version doesn't have all the weird things on the wings and top, mostly because I ran out of pieces. <laughs> and this one has a canopy that does open. Right here, the canopy. Also has landing gear that do function. The canopy, as you can see, just opens on a pivoting joint right here. It just opens all the way to reveal a full cockpit on the inside. See, there's just a control stick, and I'm going to add an ejection seat, but it would have added to the bulk, so that's what we have right there. And it just closes up to be nice and tidy. The bottom does have retractable landing gear right here. You can see that this just folds in like that. And then these doors would shut, but I can't do that because I have a microphone. And then this one right here, as you can see, just slides right in to the uh, thing right there. It normally have doors, but since it's a Lego skill, you have to make some compromises. And then these outriggers you'd normally just pull off because the real plane just sort of had to pull them off. That's the U2. And we're missing the wheel in the back, so let me go for that. 
But yeah, it's sort of a spy plane, very interesting looking spy plane. Hi, my name is Yasser Moran and I'm 16 years old and um, I brought a lot of aircraft to Brickford, Virginia this year. So what are we going to take a look at here? Okay, so right here we're taking a look at the Convair B-58 Hustler, which was the first uh, supersonic bomber in the United States Air Force fleet. And uh, what inspired me to build it is just the originality that no one has built it before and not many people may know that this bomber even exists, but the people who do will appreciate it, I hope. Now, when you first uh, set out to build this, uh, what was the, the first process in your, uh, your building journey? What did you do? Did you go out and find photos, schematics? Well, what I did was, yeah, I found schematics and I, um, I, I found the dimensions of the real airplane and I scaled them down into uh, in a scale of 1 to 47. And um, I kind of sketched it out and I, I began building from there. Now, when you're transporting this to a convention, how do you break it down? Does it just fit into a box or do certain things come apart? Well. Um, Certain parts do come apart. There is the, the tail section right here, um, which comes off uh, with Technic pins. And then there's also the front section comes off. And then usually I just flip it over into a big box that can hold all the different parts. Very cool, very cool. Now, uh, describe some of your favorite uh, parts usage uh, on the plane. I see you have a really interesting cockpit design there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree with you. The cockpit design was probably one of um, my favorite parts and uh, one of the, probably the best example of parts usage on this model. Um, also, um, the engines are pretty cool too. Thank you, thank you very much. I used actually um, some uh, Speed Champions uh, um, tire rims, hubcaps on the uh, as engine uh, turbojets. Very cool build. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. I'm Jake Sadovich. Um, and this is my uh, biplane. It's a uh, Kind of like a scale model almost of a pit special biplane, aerobatic. Um, so I just did that this summer after um, Bricks Cascade between that and uh, Bricks Slopes in Utah. So talk about the scale of this here because I noticed some unique figures kind of sprinkled throughout the build. Yeah, it's um, by the time I started getting into it and getting built, it, it decided it was closest to the Galador scale. So I have Galador and then the Galador family has a jack stone for the baby. <laughs> Not something you see in very many builds, but did you have these Galador figures on hand already, or was this something you had to pick up when you decided that you were going to do this size? Um, I had a couple that I picked up in a bulk lot, and I did have to get uh, the lady one. I don't remember her name. Okay. <laughs> Certainly some unique figures. So then for the plane itself, talk about the design of that and kind of where you started with this. Um, I started with uh, the large aircraft wings from the city, and I was going to do just kind of a just a made-up biplane. But as it progressed, and it was kind of all in grays, so as it progressed, this uh, the nose cone piece only comes in trans clear or red. Okay. So I basically changed the whole color scheme and then completely redid everything I had already done. And then I started looking at the pit special and so instead of making a made up biplane I tried to go for more of an accurate reproduction of a real plane. Mm -hmm. So I had to scrap it and start over about four times. <laughs> no dedication to the build though. So then talk about the lettering and kind of some of the stickers you've got on here. Okay, um, across the top is all brick built with all the new, nice new shaped tiles that we have. Uh, so Sato Bricks, that's kind of my Sadovich, Sato Bricks, the Lego thing, you know. And then on the back I've got, these are just vinyl stickers, so it says JS0937, so my initials and then the Lego upside down in numbers. There you go. Um, and then that one, of course, is a printed Lego brick and then just some vinyl cutout stars. You were able to add some nice kind of custom decals then to it. Yeah, yeah, and then um, it's got a lot of stickers too on on the control panel. They're all Lego stickers. If you can get in there. Yeah. And it looks like does the pilot have no arms in there right now? Yeah, I got his skinny up in the front, so I did have to take his shoulders or his arms and legs off to get him in there. And the other reason, too, is that you've got the joystick down in there and then the rudder. So I'm still kind of working on getting that right, but it's going to have full working flight okay. controls from the cockpit. Yeah. So. Nice. so do some of these parts move back here then? Yeah. Um, the elevator will move, the tail, 
the tail wheel will go with the tail once I get that system done, and then the ailerons will all go all true to form how they should be. So what's this like structurally then? Can you pick it up and kind of swish it around? Uh, how's that work? A little, because it has a pretty sturdy frame and then the sides, basically from where this nose section ends, beginning here all the way back is basically just a panel of plates and slopes okay. with uh, hinge bricks here to hinge that panel. So it's got kind of, it's got a cert pretty sturdy subframe that those panels just lay on top of. And then I like your base here, which has the very large green uh, tiles. You don't see those real often. Where, where did you pick those up from? Um, all, I got three different BrickLink orders. <laughs> um, I was actually in a store just getting some other things, and I noticed he had like 26 or something. And they were relatively cheap for that size yeah. of a tile, so I just got them. And then I did the math, and I was like, oh, I need 50 total now. <laughs> so I got some more, because I kind of wanted it to be like an air show scene where they're out here. It actually, it was sitting down on its wheels like it should, but it's, it got too heavy for its own landing gear, so the tail wheel collapsed on me. So I'm working on doing more of a permanent stand, and so this will go, all the stand parts will go to something else later. And then you even want a trophy here, so what's the trophy for? Um, it is the best of model team, first okay. place model team at BrickCon, so... Congratulations on that. Always cool to get some nice looking Lego brick built trophies for your builds. Yeah, yeah, it looks great. I've got the blue ribbon, so I was super excited about that. It was cool. <laughs> well, great work here. Thanks for bringing this to the show. I love the mix of Galador and the cool plane model and everything, so thank you so much. Yep, you're welcome, man. I'm Simon. This is um, Operation Olive Branch um, because there's a lot of olive. Um, the way that this um, layout kind of started out was uh, I built one of the ships for uh, Mactober for completely unrelated reasons. It was olive, it was orange, um, which was kind of interesting. And then I slid it aside, and I think like a year later, I built one of the little fighters. And at that point, I'd gotten a lot more olive bricks. So I'm like, oh, let's just use olive. And I built another one. And I remembered, oh, I kind of like the orange color scheme, so I built another one. And then uh, I think it goes Dronuary rolled around and I, once again I had some leftover olive and I built it and I didn't have the orange highlights but it was olive drab sort of thing and at that point I realized I've done like three major olive components why am I not scaling this up to a full fledged faction so to speak so I then decided alright this is a thing I'm going to do it so I built one of the hover dropship things, uh, which I really like. The version on display is actually version 2, or 2.5. Um, the original one I did build, I didn't really like. I retweaked and made it sleeker, a lot more play features, uh, landing gears, and so on and so forth. But the one thing I've always wanted to build was a plane. So all of this <laughs> effectively is an elaborate backdrop and excuse to build a big plane. And one of the coolest planes I've always thought was like the C-17 uh, Glowmaster 3. So I kind of wanted to do basically a futuristic version of that, keeping all the kind of iconic stylings that's on the current one. Um, and what happened is that this, the one you see is actually version 2. Version 1, I had displayed at a different show and asked a lot of uh, my lug members, what do you think? How can I improve it? And with a lot of the other stuff, they're like, well, the first one was actually much similar, cleaner than this one. It was more kind of modern day. And they said, yeah, that's cool, uh, but it doesn't really fit with the rest of the stuff. So you should like sci-fi it up. So I added a lot of um, gratuitous chunks of interesting blah um, to try to make it fit more. And yeah, the tail is actually version 4 because everyone kept saying my tail sucked. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to engineer a, a really thin, tall tail that felt right with the same aesthetic. It used to be like two bricks tall, too fat. One brick tall, eh, not very good. Um, and I finally ended up with uh, that design that I'm actually fairly happy with. And um, I was actually quite lucky to be nominated uh, and subsequently win the uh, best airship. Yeah, congratulations on that win. That's awesome. 
So I see you've got kind of the, the door down in the back there. Are there other moving parts or anything like that in the plane? Uh, not really. The door was the only thing. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of structural chunks to it. Uh, the way the wings are built um, is not overly standard, uh, but it was just more... Um, a lot of the times I may or may not have interiors. It's, it's not a very big space, um, as well as all of his relatively uh, limited parts usage. So I have to use a lot of tricks to... Uh, create shapes that could be normally accomplished easier methods, but I'd use a lot of like sideways building things to try to get the shape the way I did. Uh, the first version didn't have a functional uh, back door, and everyone complained. <laughs> Does it work? Does it open? Uh, so I did include that specifically for that. Okay, very nice. And do you have any plans to expand on this kind of theme in the future? Um. Probably not. Uh, I might build or add on, but no. I, I kind of like it where it is. Um, that being said, I have a lot of extra olive, so who knows? You never know. Maybe a couple more planes or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I should also note that one of the inspirations for this was seeing uh, Corvin's plane at Brick Fair, Virginia, which is absolutely gorgeous. Not This isn't nearly as big or as good or as accurate. He does very um, great like replicas of existing planes um, but I wanted to kind of do my own kind of sci-fi take on an existing plane that uh, I don't think has been built that much um, by the military builders. Sure. Well, very cool. Thanks for taking us through that. I appreciate it. No problem. My name is Jack and I built the B-29 here and this one's built entirely out of metallic silver. Actual Lego metallic silver pieces even though it might look like it's painted. It's it's not painted. <laughs> so, yeah, this is based off of a design that I designed about a year ago. It used to be gray. It was I brought it to World War Brick. It was the Enola Gay, and I built another one because I realized that I could build it in metallic silver. So, we've got all the things going on here. We've got the rotating turrets that are remotely operated. We through here. I'm not really sure what that is. I'm sure somebody will answer that. Um, to, to, ugh. Dual remote control turrets. There's one on the bottom and on the top. The engines use the four-bladed propellers, since you, most B-29s use the four-bladed propellers. They're decently large. The main part of the wing is built out of these 2x2 two metallic silver tiles, which they did produce in silver, but not in large quantities, so it was very hard getting all of those. It's very shiny. When you step back and just look at it, it's, it's got quite a presence that is quite noticeable. And that's what I was going for. I just wanted to make it look very, very pretty. The tail is built using yellow pieces, mostly because I would have done it all in silver, but the pieces that were available in silver they did, just didn't have them, so they didn't have these these wedges, and well, actually these are slopes, but a lot of the bricks wouldn't have been able to be done, and I just settled on yellow because I like yellow. The U.S. markings are over here and on the wings, so I know that one's not supposed to be there, but I'm going to change that for the next one. I'm just put it on and then too late, so it's built in a slightly modular design where the nose can separate from the tail. Right, can separate here and it can also separate here so it can be transported. It also has retractable landing gear on the bottom. Oh, it's kind of hard to see at this point and bomb bays. Bomb bays are down here and the retractable landing gear retracts in the engine nacelles. So that's how that works.